So tonight, where are we? I, that's our topic. Sacraments of healing, right? So how many sacraments? Seven? Three categories, right? What's the first category? Initiation. Which three are in initiation? Tori, which three are in initiation? Yeah, baptism, confirmation, and communion. All right. How do you know that? <laughs> All right. <laughs> so baptism, confirmation, and communion. Then there's two sacraments of service, and they're what? <coughs> Priesthood and holy orders, or in, in marriage, right? We'll talk about those later. And then there's two sacraments of healing. All right, so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to start uh, a little bit. We're going to get into the first one. Next week, we'll do the second one. And then a retreat, did you mention this? So I, I will. So one of the things that's a, a great chance for when we're away, um, because we have leisure, is uh, we'll probably just make an abundance of time on Saturday night for uh, those of us who are coming into the church um, to make a first confession. So uh, I'll um, talk much more about that topic next week. But tonight we're going to talk about uh, uh, anointing. So let's start with this. If you get your Bible, open up to Mark 2 or open up your phone, either way. And why are there cookies? <laughs> it's Lent. Why are there cookies? <laughs> Should not be cookies. Great. So Mark 2, uh, we're going to look at verses 1 to 12. So when he, that's Jesus, returned to Capernaum, which is how you say that word. I don't know why it's never written right. Um, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together. I just love this line. So that there was no longer room for them, not even about the door. And he was preaching the word to them. So uh, Capernaum is um, the place where Jesus makes his hometown. Peter's house is there. You can still go into it or the remains of it. We, we know that almost for certain. There's a church built on top of it. Capernaum is a small little town, so the archaeological remains are all there. Um, Jesus, here's the way I, I often think of Jesus. Jesus is like everybody's favorite uncle. I Meaning he comes into town and everybody comes to the house. And so the whole town hears that he's home and they crowd in around the, t the, uh, the door. And he's preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. Now let's just pause right there. So, th this passage, we're going to unpack this a fair amount, but I just want to try to, if you have an imagination where you can close your eyes and picture something, try to do that right now with this scene, okay? So, close your eyes, put yourself in a scene where it's a packed house. So Jesus is home, he's got this extraordinary healing capacity, which is why the whole town is there. He's, he's magnetic, he's charismatic, he's dynamic, Things he touch get well, and he's been healing. Popularity has spread, and all of a sudden, they came, right? Who's the they? Friends of a man who's paralyzed. So they hear the Lord's in town. They go get their friend who can't move. They put him on a stretcher. They pick him up. They get to the house. They bring him there because they want Jesus to heal him, right? They get there, they see the huge crowd, they're like, no way, we're not waiting for this. They climb up on top of the roof. They rip apart the roof. They raise the man up. They drop the man down in front of Jesus. They've gone through all this trouble. They lower a paralyzed man in front of the Lord. The Lord looks at the man who can't move and says, I forgive you. Now imagine you're one of those friends. 
Because if I'm one of those friends and I'm climbing up on the roof and I'm trying to listen to what's going on down below and I hear that, I go, you what? You, you forgive him? Great, that's nice and all, but have you noticed he can't move? Like, that's why we brought him to you. The man can't move. W right? Wouldn't you do the same? So he said, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak thus? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question thus in your hearts? Which is easier? Make sure you get the answer to this right. Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, take up your pallet and walk? Which one's easier to say? Which one's easier to say? Why is rise up and walk easier to say? No, no, no. Which one's easier for you or me? To, which one's easier for anybody to say to somebody? Mm -mm. No, just the obvious thing. Like, which one's easier to say here? Yeah, your sins are forgiven. Why? Yeah, who knows, right? I say to the guy who can't walk, get up and walk, and the guy doesn't get up and walk. I'm a quack, right? Everybody leaves. So Jesus is posing a situation to the people who are doubting that he can do what it is he's doing with this man, namely forgiving him. And so he poses this question. And then, catch this, the only reason, apparently, that Jesus makes the paralyzed man able to move is because they don't think he can forgive. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your pallet, and go home. And he rose and immediately took up the pallet and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. This passage, I would argue, is the um, best passage to understand what we're going to talk about tonight in the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. So these two sacraments of healing that have been left to us by the Lord uh, help us in our battle with the different afflictions that come our way in life. So the two sacraments, again, are penance and the anointing of the sick. And as with all the sacraments, they continue on earth in our time, that ministry which Jesus began when he was walking the earth physically. So the friends of the paralytic are fixated on their friend's physical pain, right? Which is usually the case with most of us. But Jesus is not only concerned with physical pain. In fact, we could infer from the gospel and from the scriptures as a whole that the greatest pain, the most serious pain, is not physical pain, it's spiritual pain. In fact, the most serious pain, the most horrific disease of all is sin. That's which is most crippling in our lives. Physical pain can't keep me from heaven. Sin can. So tonight, next week, we're going to focus in on how it is that the Lord deals with both of these, okay? So let's look at the anointing of the sick. Here's the most important thing I know how to say about <laughs> this sacrament. It always works. So all the sacraments always work. You get baptized, especially as an adult, you don't walk out of the font and go, hmm, did I get born anew or not? I'm not really sure. My sins washed away, or were they not? Right? 
you walk out of confession, and hopefully anyway, if you're not going on feelings, you go, ah, did I get forgiven? Did I not? Come back from communion, you don't go, did I get the Lord or did I not? And yet a lot of Catholics' approach to the sacrament of the sick is something like playing craps. Like, I just hope I get the right numbers on the dice. I hope this takes. But that's not at all how we want to approach this. So this sacrament always works. The challenge is to understand how it works. So you and I, I would suggest, we're often like the friends of the paralytic. Meaning, in our minds, it looks abundantly clear what it is the Lord needs to do. Here's the problem. We're often wrong. So, no offense to anybody in here in the medical profession, but you're all practicing physicians. There's only one real physician. His name's Jesus. And he has the ultimate MRI. And he's the only one who can see that which is most wrong with us. So in the case of this man in Mark chapter 2, though it looked like what was most crippling him was his physical paralysis, in fact, that which was most confining him was something in his past that he didn't think he could be forgiven. So the Lord forgives him. And forgiveness, even if I can't walk anymore, makes all the difference in the world versus being able to walk and not being forgiven keeps me bound. All right, with me on that? So what we need to do is just to, uh, is to trust that the Lord knows what's best. Because most of us, at least if you're like me, oftentimes we have at least this mindset that we may not say it out loud because it just sounds so stupid when you say it out loud. I mean, if God would only listen to me and do what I know needs to happen here, everything would be fine. So again, it sounds dumb out loud, but we live that way often. Why isn't he doing this? Is he too busy with Haiti or whatever? So we've got to trust that the Lord is the physician and he knows what he's about. So we just want to drag people to Jesus, uh, which is exactly what we do when we pray for one another and when we bring people to him for the, uh, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. So to, uh, to really grasp this sacrament, I would suggest we need to at least touch on the fact that um, we need to get like a biblical vision of how to think about suffering. So clearly, suffering and pain are amongst life's greatest tragedies, right? Like, I hate pain. <laughs> we do, most of us, everything we can to avoid it. And our culture as a whole sees um, no purpose to it or to suffering. And suffering and pain can have one of two effects in a person's life. They can either drive you closer to God or they can drive you from him. And those of us who are in this room right now, we've had those experiences ourselves and we certainly know people who've had those experiences. Why has all this happened to me? Why has God done this to me? And the enemy who's always lurking, huh? he's just longing to milk that and exploit that for all he can to make us think that God is not a good father and that he's abandoned us or that he's punishing us or that he's not even there and don't waste our time and just curse him and die. So in the Old Testament, the Jewish people rightly grasped that there's some sort of connection between physical pain and sin. Not that um, the fact that someone's suffering means that they sinned. Just that there's a connection between sin and suffering. And we talked about this at the very beginning of uh, becoming Catholic, right? That amongst the many results of the rebellion of Adam and Eve at the very beginning, when we fall prey to the deception of the enemy and sell ourselves into slavery, is a break with God, a break between men and women, a break within ourselves, and a break between us and creation. Everything begins to break apart. Suffering enters into the world. Death enters into the world. Pain enters into the world. In Eden, before the fall, there was no suffering and there was no pain. 
So, in fact, there is uh, an intimate connection, right, between suffering and pain, or between suffering and sin. And yet, the Jewish people also had revealed to them that the sufferings can have uh, what we would call, especially as Catholics, a redemptive meaning. Here's an example. So we're going to hear this passage as we get closer to Holy Week. This is one of those great prophecies in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, about the Lord, the Lord Jesus. As yet in the Old Testament, when this is revealed, this figure that they're talking about is unknown. It only becomes clear that who, who's being spoken about is Jesus. It was the will of the Lord to bruise him. So as you're hearing this, put your eyes on the crucifix, huh? It was the will of the Lord to bruise him. The him is Jesus, even though it's not known yet here. He has put him to grief. When he makes himself an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the fruit of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. So we're going to need to explain this a little bit if we're going to understand this sacrament and what I think is one of the church's greatest gifts, especially to the modern world, um, with regards to an understanding of suffering. So let's look at Jesus' ministry. So the Lord came to heal. So I often think of us, like the human, the human race is like Humpty Dumpty. So we fell off the wall at the fall, and we all went broken to pieces, and we can't put ourselves back together. The Lord came to put us back together. He, to save um, is more literally to heal in all the different ways that that implies, physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, every way. Like that's what the Lord is doing even now amongst us. It will happen um, in a fulfilled way when we get into heaven. We will be perfectly as we were created to be. We're not now, clearly. He's in the process of putting us back together, even as our bodies are in the process of decaying, which is the prelude to resurrection. All right? You with me? So the Lord came to heal. And we see this all throughout the pages of the New Testament. So he heals the blind, he heals the lame, he heals the mute, he heals lepers. He heals everything and everyone, or not everyone, actually. That's important. But he heals everything. There's nothing that he can't heal. He brings dead people back to life, whether it's Lazarus or the widow of Nain's son or Jairus' daughter, the three resurrections in the Gospels. But when he heals, he doesn't usually just speak. He usually does things, and sometimes they're kind of bizarre. So here's Mark again. They came to him, or they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him, this is Jesus, to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had, get this, huh, spit on his eyes and laid his hands upon him, he asked him, do you see anything? Well, this is a little graphic, right? <laughs> I mean, how should you be the blind man? You have no idea what's coming, and then, <laughs> whoa, like, what? Dude, what was that, you know? <laughs> so remember we talked about why sacraments? In the very beginning when we started talking about this section, one of the reasons we said why sacraments is, is because of the condition that you and I are made in. We're not just spirits. We're bodies and spirits. We encounter reality through the senses. God uses stuff to heal us, especially in the fact that he became stuff, right, by becoming man. So... Material things are good, and he uses them for the purposes of healing. So in the sacraments, to this day, Jesus continues to touch us. And that's, again, what the sacraments are. They're just a continuation in our day of what it was that Jesus was doing when he was walking amongst us. Now, that said, Jesus did not heal everyone.
people were dying all around him. And he let them. People were sick all around him. And he didn't cure them. He cured many. He didn't cure all physically. He does go to the cross for all, right? So he heals the most uh, horrific of pain, which is sin. He doesn't heal everybody's physical pain. So his healings were supposed to be and were a sign of the more radical healing that he came to give, which was, again, this healing from sin. So Jesus heals us from sin. Again, if you put your eyes back on the cross, um, we could say um, by suffering. So you and I are not saved by Jesus' miracles. We're not saved by his teaching. We're not saved by his parables. We're saved by his suffering or by his love, which is made manifest in suffering to the point of giving himself away. Okay? With me on that? So suffering, in other words, why not a good thing, and it is not a good thing, can be used for good purposes. And the ultimate proof of that is the Lord's passion and his death. So let's say that another way. Again, put your eyes on the crucifix. That is the most active moment of Jesus' life. That's not happening to him. We said this before when we were talking about the kerygma at the very beginning, huh? You can't nail God to a cross. You don't have that nail. There's only one way for God to get on a cross. That's if he wants to be there. So he's willing to be there. He's eager somehow and for some reason to be there. So again, we want to be really careful as we talk about this so that we don't look at all like we're romanticizing suffering because we are not romanticizing suffering. To be a Catholic is not to be a masochist. Suffering is itself an evil. It can be used for good. And Jesus proves that by showing what it is that he's done for us on the cross and by redeeming us through it. Therefore, all suffering, whatever form it takes, whether it's uh, physical pain, uh, depression, anxiety, you name it, can be used for good. And when it is, we call that redemptive suffering. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah? We'll have some time to talk afterwards at tables especially. Uh, St. Paul makes this abundantly clear in what I think is um, the most challenging passage in the whole New Testament. So this is his letter to the Colossians. Colossians 1, verse 24. This is Paul writing. <coughs> now, lest you think Paul's got, you know, a hangnail um, Paul has been uh, stoned and left for dead. That's a pretty thorough job. They stoned him. They thought he was dead. They walked away. He survived. All right? He's been beaten with rods. He's been lashed. He's been shipwrecked. He, he, Paul's body must look like a mangled man. So when you hear this man say, I rejoice in my sufferings, <laughs> Paul knows suffering, okay? I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I complete. Get a load of that. In my flesh I complete what's lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, or in another translation, what's lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body which is the church. Here, so this is what Paul's saying. I, in my flesh, am filling up what's lacking in the sufferings of Jesus for the sake of the church. In other words, the people I, Paul, am caring for. How do you make sense out of that? Don't answer. Just think, what, what in the world is lacking in Jesus' suffering on the cross? He's the Savior of the world. 
Is Paul writing here saying, man, if the Lord was just hung on for like another two hours, everything would have been done. No, clearly not. There's only one thing lacking in the sufferings of Jesus. What is it? My participation in it. And yours. That's what's lacking. So here's another way to say it. There's, there's one Savior of the world. His name is Jesus. But he invites you and me to participate with him in nothing less than his work of redeeming the world. There's one priest. His name is Jesus. We all become participants in his priesthood by baptism. And then again, those who are ordained in a different way by holy orders. There's one son of God, Jesus. We all become participants in his sonship by baptism. God has this extraordinary desire to include us in the work that's his. You got that? Okay. This passage, more than any other passage, I mean, I saw this lived out by my mom for most of my life. So my mom was, uh, my mom had an accident shortly before I was born. As a result of that, she wasn't supposed to have any children. They told her to abort me because they didn't think she'd survive pregnancy. Um, she didn't. I'm really grateful for that, actually. And um, she, um, she grew up, or I grew up, watching my mom more or less a cripple. So she had four surgeries or so when I was a young boy. Never got her better. Um, she had a brace around her back the entire time. She slept in a hospital bed in our living room. Um, we had special chairs for her to sit in. She couldn't sit for long. She couldn't stand for long. She couldn't walk for long. She, her whole life was just one of pain. When um, I was 12, 13 or so, my mom experienced what that man in Mark chapter 2 went through. So my mom went from being a cripple and an invalid to um, playing tennis in a month and then became club champ and then became the most athletic woman I've ever known in my life. So literally overnight, my mom went from in a bed to on her feet and there was no medical explanation for it at all. And that might be a cute little story for you all, but for me and for my sisters and my brother, it was no story. My whole life, she was an invalid until that moment. And then she was well for about 20 years. And then 20 years later, my mom's back went out again. And my mom, because by this time, her faith was, as you can imagine, just like this man who got healed by Jesus, um, when that happens to you, you just give everything back to Jesus. <laughs> like, I'm going to serve the man who healed me. Yeah, so I was a cripple. I'm not a cripple anymore. You can have my life. I'll do whatever you want. That was my mom. So she's uh, in a profound friendship with the Lord. 20 years later, the back pain comes back, and she knew um, somehow, mysteriously, this was a gift. So people would pray for her to get well, and it, uh, eventually she would just say, it's okay. I know the Lord can heal me. He did it once. He obviously doesn't want to. He has something else for me to do. And she knew this verse. And so my mom kept, I, uh, when she died, my sisters and I all uh, divided them up, um, legal pads. So my mom would write the names of people that she would pray for that she would do this for. So I would call her repeatedly and say, Mom, will you please pray for this couple who's struggling in their marriage, for this young girl who's considering an abortion, for this young boy who's addicted to whatever, for this, I mean, my mom, there are boatloads of people from this parish all over legal pads that my mom had and from countless places all over the world. And what she would do is she would just hold these notebooks and say, Lord, I give you this pain for them. That's redemptive suffering. There are marriages that are healed because of that. There are people whose lives have been radically changed because of that. That's what happens when we will say to the Lord, this is how my mom would pray. She would simply say, Lord, you know I don't like this. I would rather not have this. 
I hate pain. But I trust that I am in your hands and that you know what you're doing and there must be some purpose to this. I don't need to know what that purpose is. It's enough for me to know that this is not in vain. Any more than that was in vain. If you and I had been there on that day that we call good now, Good Friday, we saw that, we would have thought, what in the world is going to come of that? Another man executed by the Romans. Well, what good came of that? <laughs> Redemption of the world. And so the challenge for us, when, not if, when we suffer, right, is what are we going to do? We can either waste it, which is what I usually do, complain, that's what I do, or we can say, Lord, I give you this, and I give it to you for them. And when we do that, that's redemptive suffering. Okay? So anybody know the name Viktor Frankl? Viktor Frankl was an, a survivor of Auschwitz. Huh? Remember that? So Frankl was, went on to become a, um, a tremendous writer and therapist uh, after World War II. And he created um, a therapy called logotherapy. And he came up with this math mathematical form or formula, which is um, spot on. Suffering minus meaning equals despair. Suffering minus meaning equals despair. Suffering plus meaning equals redemptive suffering. So I see this all the time in my life as a priest. I'm anointing someone, I'm praying with someone, and I'll give them something to do, right? So because the challenge is what? When, when, why, why is the prayer of someone who suffers so powerful? Simply because um, when I'm suffering, I'm most inclined to be selfish for pretty obvious reasons. Like, I hurt. <laughs> I'm dying. Care for me, right? When I turn that into an act of love, then it becomes extraordinarily powerful. So a friend of mine uh, used to do retreats with Mother Teresa. And he was with her one time when he walked in, she walked into a hospital. And there were two brothers in the hospital room. And they're both suffering. I think they both had leprosy, actually. So he's down in India. And he, she walks in. He's right beside her. She points to one brother and says, you take Russia. She walks to the other brother. She goes, you take China. And then she walked out. <laughs> and my friend stands there. He's like, what the heck just happened here? And what happens, and, and I see this all the time when I'm giving people, people to pray for, they began to set up. Like suddenly, I have purpose. Right? Because when I'm, you go into a nursing home, you go into a hospital, you visit somebody who has no sense of meaning, and I am despairing, I am depressed, I am slumped over, you give them something to do with this, and suddenly, I got purpose. I got meaning. Everything's different. The pain's still there. That hasn't gone away magically. But I got something to do with this now. And I keep my eyes on the Lord and on his cross, and I remember, just as that was not in vain, this is not in vain. And one day, not now, but one day, God's going to show me what he did with this. And when he does, it's going to be amazing. When my mom died, I had this image of the Lord just kind of walking her around heaven and looking down on earth and on all the homes uh, where the people whose names were on these legal pads lived. And it was like he could look into the home with my mom and he would just point and he goes, you see that couple right there? You know, they're still together. Do you know why? Because of your prayers. See that man over there? He's not drinking anymore. You know why? Because you united your suffering to my cross. See that young girl over there who was tempted to take her life? She's alive and doing great. You know why? Because of you. Because of your participation, your willing participation in my cross. That's redemptive suffering.
And yet, Jesus healed, and he still heals. So we don't want to... I don't want you to end on that uh, thought by thinking, well, I guess we just, when suffering comes, you just, okay, let's just do something with this. I mean, the first thing you do is you say, Lord, if you would, it'd be great if you would heal me. <laughs> and he heals. All right? Doesn't heal us all, obviously, but he does heal. And I've seen lots of miracles over and above my mom's. And he also commanded us to heal others. Like I pictured I pictured the disciples, you know, there's a passage in the gospel where Jesus, you know, he, he gathers the 12 together with him. He says, um, go into the towns and drive out demons and heal the sick. And then I picture he goes to bed and they stay up and they go, what in the world is he talking about? Like he's got to be out of his mind. And yet that's what they went, that's what they did. And his people continue to do that today. It's why we do prayer ministry here at Mass and other times throughout the year. Because God continues to heal. we got to be like the friends of the paralytic. I don't know how he's going to heal. He might heal in a way that only he can see. He might heal dramatically and physically. But he heals still in our day, all the time. And the early church knew this, and they practiced from the beginning what becomes the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. So, the letter to, of James, New Testament. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church or the presbyters of the church or what we would say now the priests of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith will save the sick man and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So the church has always, uh, in a particular way, in the basis of this passage, which is just a continuation in the what we would call the pastoral letters after um, the ascension of our Lord into heaven, um, have has seen the uh, this sacrament left to us by the Lord and something that we're con we're supposed to be continuing. So let's talk um, a little bit about the actual celebration of the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. And there's three points that we want to examine, especially. So just like it says in this passage from James. Um, it's been associated with blessed oil as well as the, the laying on of hands and the prayer of, of the elder or the presbyter, which would be the bishop or the priest. And it's been that way from the beginning, right? This is first century. So blessed oil, laying on of hands, and the prayer of the elder. And so somewhat recently it was reserved to the point of death or to near the point of death. So some people who are older, when they see a priest walk into a hospital, they panic. Like to this day, like I walk in, they're like, I'm dying? It's like, no, don't worry. Like, it's all right. I just came to say hi. <laughs> <laughs> so some of us still remember those days. It's not that way anymore. It used to be called extreme unction. So it was the anointing at the very end of someone's life. So it was only given at the moment of near death. It's not that way at all anymore. So now the sacrament is administered um, when someone is going in for surgery, someone's diagnosed with cancer, someone's battling depression, right? Could be lots of different reasons when we ad would administer this uh, sacrament. Unlike, say, baptism, you can receive this multiple times. I've anointed some people so many times, they're probably waterlogged. <laughs> so... Um, And like all the rest of the sacraments, it should be administered with at least some proclamation of the scriptures. I always use that passage in Mark chapter 2. If you've been anointed by me, you've heard that passage from me. And I've told you what I'm doing right now is I am dragging you to Jesus. And on my end, it looks pretty obvious like what he needs to do is X. And I might be right and I might be wrong, but he's going to heal you somehow. He's going to do something. We just got to trust him and let him do what it is he wants to do. So it's accompanied by the scriptures, and it's often uh, accompanied as well by confession. Not always, but often. And sometimes it's also accompanied by the Eucharist. So there's four effects of the sacrament, or the way I would think of this is, what do I get out of it? 
the catechism lists four. I'll, I'll add a fifth, which I have no idea why it's not in there. But I'll take that up with them later. So the first thing, the first effect, huh? It's a particular gift of the Holy Spirit to the person. So what is that gift? It could be peace. Like whenever I, whenever I anoint somebody and then I pray with them, I always just ask the Lord, Lord, just rid them of anxiety. Let them know that their life is in your hands and that you are a good father and that nothing has changed. When they were born, they were in your hands. Before they were diagnosed with whatever, they were in your hands. Now that they are where they are, they are still in your hands. They are not subject to circumstances or to fate or even to physicians. They are your children and you have them. So banish anxiety and replace it with the quiet confidence and the peace that only you can give from knowing that. It might be the courage to suffer well. That's a gift of the Spirit. I've seen that in countless people. That's not something that we do by our own willpower. That's a gift that the Holy Spirit gives to us. Second thing it does <coughs> is union with the passion of Jesus. So here's how the catechism puts it. By the grace of this sacrament, the sick person receives the strength and the gifts of uniting himself more closely to Christ's passion. In a certain way, he is consecrated to bear fruit by configuration to the Savior's redemptive passion. Suffering, a consequence of original sin, acquires a new meaning. It becomes a participation in the saving work of Jesus. That is an extraordinary thing to say. Jesus, Jesus invites those who suffer to participate with him in his work of saving the world. There's only one Savior. Don't, don't miss that. But we're invited to participate in it. It's not fun. It's not romantic. It hurts like crazy. It might be all black as you're going through it, but it's not in vain. And the Spirit gives us grace to do this, okay? A third grace of the Holy Spirit is uh, an ecclesial grace is given. Here's how the Catechism describes this. The sick who receive this sacrament by freely uniting themselves to the passion and death of Christ contribute to the good of the people of God. In other words, the gift here is for us, for the church at large. That's what ecclesial means, right? <clears throat> By celebrating the sacrament of the church, or the church in the communion of saints, intercedes for the benefit of the sick person, and he, for his part, through the grace of the sacrament, contributes to the sanctification of the church and to the good of all men for whom the church suffers and offers herself through Christ to God the Father. The way St. Paul puts this, when one member suffers, the whole body suffers. When one member rejoices, the whole body rejoices. You and I are intimately connected with each other. We don't think that way as Americans. I'm a radically autonomous human being. No, you're not. <laughs> you're a member of the body of Christ, which means I'm supposed to feel pain over the pain of those in the body. It's supposed to affect me. And my suffering can affect others. Joe talked last week, I think, a little bit about fasting, right? One of the purposes of fasting, one of the purposes of fasting is I can offer that for others. Fasting is a suffering. That's what it is, right? I am not eating. That might be a minor suffering, but it's still a suffering, right? No cookies. I'm giving those up for you. <laughs> Become holy. Don't let this be in vain on my part, all right? Otherwise, I'm going to gobble them up. So 
we're all connected with each other. And we, the more we can think that way, like your holiness helps me grow in holiness. Your, sinful, your sinfulness weakens me. My growth in holiness helps you. My sinfulness weakens you. Sin is never private. Ever. No matter if anybody ever knows what you and I have done, it's never private. Because we're all connected with each other. And grace and holiness is never private. Because we're all connected with each other. So we grow with each other, we help each other, we encourage each other, or we discourage each other. The scandals in the church just show this in spades, right? Like, these sins that these people committed, have they impacted you or not? Absolutely, right? Because sin's not private. And so it is with those who are married and their sins impacting me. Because sin's not private. We together grow or we get weaker. That's why the pursuit of holiness is a serious pursuit for all of us. And I'm painfully aware of how my sins can impact others and weaken others. Fourth effect of the anointing of the sick, the last one in the eyes of the catechism, a preparation for the final journey home. So here's how the catechism describes this. If the sacrament of anointing of the sick is given to all who suffer from serious illness and infirmity, even more rightly is it given to those at the point of departing this life. So it is called the sacrament of those departing. The anointing of the sick completes our conformity to the death and resurrection of Christ, just as baptism began it. It completes the holy anointings that mark the whole Christian life, that of baptism, which sealed the new life in us, that of confirmation, which strengthened us for the combat of this life. This last anointing fortifies the end of our earthly life like a solid rampart for the final struggles before entering the Father's house. If you've ever been with someone as they're dying and you've heard the prayers of commendation that a priest prays, they are extraordinary. Go forth, Christian soul, from this world to the God who made you and who died for you. And the grace of being with somebody as they're dying and they're anointed is irreplaceable. So it's a preparation for the final journey home. Those are the four effects listed in the catechism of the sacrament of the sick. There's a fifth one that I think is glaringly missing. Anybody want to guess? Yeah, you get better, right? Like, how is that not there? You get better. <laughs> you get well. It actually takes, <laughs> right? <laughs> how is that not in there? I have no idea. It, it, this can foster the impression, you know, like, well, I guess we're just going to get into this now. We're just going to offer it up. Oh, well, it would have been nice if Jesus could do a miracle for me, but I guess he doesn't do miracles anymore, so darn. You know, like, God still does miracles. I've seen blind people get better. I've seen cripples walk. I've seen people cured of cancer. I've seen a woman who miscarried see her child born, and the child is still alive. I've seen extraordinary things. So have a lot of people in this room. If you've gone through Alpha, we pray for people all the time during the course of Alpha, and we've seen exceptional healings. We had a woman here uh, not too long ago who was 20 weeks pregnant, went to see a doctor. Um, the doctor said that the child was in danger and she was in danger. Placenta wasn't delivering nutrients to the child. child had at least two genetic anomalies. Probably Downs, or, or at least possibly Downs, facing serious issues. Mom and dad came and prayed here. This is when we had the relic of Solanus Casey. They brought an ultrasound of the child, placed it in front of the relic. This isn't anointing. This is just asking, does God still heal? Placed the 
ultrasound in front of the relic, asked the intercession of Blessed Solanus. She had a meeting with her geneticist the following Tuesday. She walks in, they do an MRI, they do an ultrasound, the geneticist looks at her and says, I have no idea why you're here. You, you're perfectly healthy and so is your child. It's not like they had a bad reading. Here's the, here's the ultrasound from last week. Here's the ultrasound from this week. We got other stories of miraculous healings. So God really does heal, okay? So I would summarize all five of these effects into three. So either the person's physically healed, they're given the strength to suffer well, or they're prepared for the journey home. Okay? So how about at table we do these? Sure, sorry. Write faster. So either the person's physically healed. <laughs> <laughs> Told you to pray for me. Uh, or they're given strength to suffer well, or they're prepared for the journey home. That's a great expression, suffer well. Grieve well, suffer well. Meaning what? Meaning don't waste it. Don't waste your pain. Everybody here has pain. Don't waste it. It's not in vain. Don't let the enemy think, make you think that. All of this is for naught. No purpose to it. We don't know the purpose of it usually in this life. You will one day. Jesus promises in the Gospel of John, on that day, the day when we get home, you won't have any questions. I got a boatload of questions right now. But he promises on that day, you won't have any questions. That day, you're going to see everything and you go, oh, huh. that's what you did with that? That's how you use that? A friend of mine says, the beginning of eternity, I think we probably just start walking around going, of course. <laughs> like, of course that's what you did with that. Why didn't I see that? Of course. So at table, let's, let's tackle these two questions. The whole question of suffering, why God allows people to suffer, is for many individuals an impediment to embracing the faith. Has this been an issue for you? And how? I think we're at the point right now, having been together for as long as we are, we can tackle a question like that. Second, recognizing that transformation of the mind and the spirit often happens only gradually. Is there an idea or two in tonight's reflection on the sacrament of the anointing of the sick that you feel could potentially help change the way you view suffering? If nothing else, I would hope that you will hang on to Viktor Frankl's equation. Frankl was a devout Jew. I don't know about you, but I can't, I, I've been to Auschwitz three times. He lived it. I don't ever want to go there again. He lived in it. And he comes up with that formula. <laughs> Suffering minus meaning equals despair. He found meaning. And he recognized those who had something to live for in the midst of hell on earth found purpose. If that can happen there, uh, it can happen in my life and yours. Okay? So let's tackle those at table. <laughs>